Imagine a city, a colossal, 110,000 ton steel behemoth that never needs to refuel, slicing through the waves, launching cutting edge stealth jets every 30 seconds from four electromagnetic rails. Sounds like something out of a sci fi movie, right? Well, China just built it. Or at least, they're building it. The Type 004 is slated to hit the water before this decade is out, and for the first time since 1945, the US Navy could be facing a carrier that, on paper, is bigger, busier, and maybe even better. Does that automatically mean American dominance at sea is finished, or is there more to the story than just steel and steam? Let's dive in and find out. So, let's talk about the new kid on the block, China's Type 004. This isn't just another carrier, it's their first nuclear-powered flat-up, a true game-changer in many ways. Satellite imagery from yards at Jiangnan, and now Dalian, reveals a hull that's only about 6 meters shorter than the mighty USS Gerald R. Ford. But here's a crucial design difference. The island's superstructure sits significantly farther aft on the 004, cleverly freeing up deck space for at least three additional fighter spots. This isn't just about aesthetics, it's about maximizing operational efficiency. Underneath that massive deck, whispers, backed by some pretty solid procurement leaks, point to two molten salt reactors. Now, if you're a naval tech enthusiast, you'll know this is a big deal. These aren't your grandpa's nuclear reactors, they're slated to drive an integrated electric propulsion system. Think about it. Unlimited range, similar to what US supercarriers enjoy, meaning the Type 004 can stay at sea for extended periods without needing to pull into port for refueling, limited only by the crew's endurance and supplies. The US actually studied and shelved this very architecture back in the 2000s, finding it too complex or costly at the time. For China, it translates into not just endless cruising, but also enough spare megawatts to power future energy-hungry weapon systems like railguns or directed energy weapons. Then there are the catapults. The Type 004 is expected to boast four electromagnetic aircraft launch systems, or EMALS, each stretching about 120 meters long. This matches the Ford class and is a significant leap from China's earlier ski jump carriers. With four EMALS, Beijing can theoretically hurl a 35-ton KJ-600 early warning aircraft into the sky every 45 seconds. That's a faster cycle time than many Nimitz-class operations and equals the Ford's ambitious design goal for sortie generation. So, bottom line, on paper, the Type 004 isn't just a copy of Western designs, it's a generational jump, a deliberate move meant to fight the world's most experienced navy on remarkably equal terms, at least in terms of raw hardware. Numbers, as they say, matter. A lot. The Type 004 is projected to carry a truly formidable air wing of anywhere from 90 to 100 fixed-wing aircraft. That's a significant leap compared to the approximately 75 aircraft a Ford-class carrier typically embarks today. We're talking about an expected mix of 24 to 30 J-35 stealth fighters, China's answer to the F-35C, designed specifically for carrier operations and low observable strike missions. Then there are around 20 J-15T heavy strike aircraft, 4K J-600 AEW and C platforms, crucial for airborne early warning and command, much like the US E-2D Hawkeye, plus a contingent of advanced drones, including stealthy GJ-11 or GJ-21 UCAVs. This diverse air wing would certainly enhance its strike and reconnaissance capabilities. But here's the kicker. Quantity is only half the equation in carrier aviation. You see, US sailors have been launching 30-ton fighters off moving decks since 1922. It's in their DNA. Chinese deck crews, on the other hand, have been doing it for less than 10 years, and for electromagnetic catapults, even less. Think about the sheer complexity, catapult maintenance, the precise timing of jet blast deflectors, the split-second replacement of arresting wires, the coordinated ballet of moving aircraft across a crowded deck. Every single step is muscle memory for the Americans, a finely honed instinct passed down through generations. For the PLA Navy, it's often still a maths exam, a carefully calculated procedure rather than an intuitive flow. 
and tell the Type 004 and its crews can consistently complete nighttime, all-weather surge drills at a blistering pace of 140 sorties per day. A design goal for the Ford, not just a theoretical possibility, those extra jets are just potential, not power. They're impressive hardware waiting for the human element to truly unlock their combat effectiveness. Let's zoom in on those launch and recovery systems. Both the Type 004 and the Ford-class carriers rely on EMALS, but their journeys with this cutting-edge technology are vastly different. The Ford's version already boasts over 8,000 successful aircraft launches, accumulating invaluable operational data. This isn't just about showing off, it's about refining the system, understanding its quirks, and building reliability. The Chinese system, while impressive, has only ground-tested around 4,000 cycles at its Wangdishang facility last year. Crucially, seagoing data, real-world performance under dynamic conditions, is still zero. And here's where it gets tricky. Steam versus electromagnetic catapults have fundamentally different wear patterns. Early reliability issues could easily plague Beijing, much like they initially embarrassed Washington back in 2014 when the Ford was still getting its EMALS up to speed. It's a complex piece of kit, and real-world sea trials expose all the hidden gremlins. But perhaps an even bigger headache for the PLA Navy might be the glaring lack of dedicated electronic warfare aircraft. The US Navy fields the combat-proven EA-18G Growler, a specialized jammer that can escort F-35Cs deep inland, suppressing enemy air defenses and clearing a path for strike packages. It's an invisible but absolutely critical shield. China's equivalent, the J-15D, is still in prototype, and we haven't seen a twin-seat trainer variant flying from a carrier deck yet. Without a fully developed, operationally mature escort jammer, the O-4's impressive air wing must rely on ground-based support, or worse, stay under the protective umbrella of shore-based missile coverage. That's hardly the recipe for projecting blue water dominance, is it? It significantly limits their operational reach and survivability in a contested electromagnetic environment. A supercarrier, no matter how advanced, is utterly useless without a robust logistical tail. Think of it as a floating city that needs constant resupply. We're talking about tankers, magazines, spare parts, and accessible ports. The US Navy, with decades of global operations under its belt, can tap into a vast network, a 500-ship maritime sealift command fleet, over 40 allied bases scattered strategically across the globe, and four dedicated carrier resupply docks in critical locations like Japan, Bahrain, Spain, and Guam. This isn't just about fuel, it's about beans, bullets, and band-aids, food, ammunition, spare parts, medical supplies, and everything else a carrier strike group needs to stay operational for months on end. Contrast that with China, their first overseas support point in Djibouti is a staggering 8,000 kilometers from San Diego, but more importantly, it's 11,000 kilometers from the South China Sea if you have to go via the Indian Ocean. That's a monumental distance for sustained operations. And what about refueling at sea, the lifeblood of blue water navies? The PLA Navy currently has a modest fleet of 623,000 ton Type 901 fast combat support ships. The US, by comparison, operates 34 comparable oilers and 12 ammunition haulers, capable of transferring millions of gallons of jet fuel and tons of ordnance while underway. In a prolonged clash, the Type 004 might win the first salvo, but it could easily run dry of aviation fuel for its jets before the second week is out. Yes, nuclear propulsion keeps the carrier itself moving indefinitely, but it doesn't magically fill its aviation fuel tanks or restock its magazines. This logistical disparity is a critical vulnerability that will take China decades, and a massive global infrastructure build-out, to overcome. Hardware is one thing. The human element is another entirely, and arguably, far more difficult to replicate. For US carrier skippers, the path to the flag bridge is a long, arduous one. They grow up flying FA-18s, commanding destroyer squadrons, and completing multiple major exercises that push them to their limits all before they even get a sniff of commanding a carrier. This builds an unparalleled depth of operational experience and tactical decision-making. The average Chinese carrier captain today, however, might have maybe 18 months of fixed-wing deck time. That's a huge gap in practical, high-stakes experience. 
Let's think about a real-world nightmare scenario. An F-35C loses an engine at launch. American Landing Signal Officers LSOs, have rehearsed that emergency thousands of times, not just in simulators, but in simulators they themselves helped design, reflecting decades of real-world incidents and lessons learned. Their Chinese counterparts, while undoubtedly diligent, are currently practicing on land-based mock-ups that, no matter how sophisticated, simply cannot replicate the chaotic, dynamic environment of a ship pitching in 30-knot crosswinds at sea. War at sea is unforgiving. Small procedural gaps, a moment of hesitation, or a lack of intuitive understanding can quickly snowball into lost sorties, lost aircraft, and ultimately, lost battles. Hardware parity minus doctrinal maturity and deep operational experience equals vulnerability. It's an invisible catapult, one built on decades of blood, sweat, and lessons learned. Modern carriers don't fight alone. They are integral nodes in a vast, interconnected kill web. A Ford-class carrier, for instance, embarks with systems like Cooperative Engagement Capability CEC, Naval Integrated Fire Control Counter-Air NIFCCA, and robust satellite links that fuse data from its F-35Cs, E-2D Advanced Hawkeyes, and SM-6 missiles carried by its escort ships. This creates a real-time, shared operational picture, allowing for rapid decision-making and coordinated engagements far beyond the carrier's immediate horizon. It's a symphony of sensors and shooters, all working in concert. The Ford also features cutting-edge technologies like the dual-band radar DBR, designed to combine X-band and S-band radar functions for superior search and tracking. While the DBR has faced some initial challenges and is even slated for replacement on future Ford-class carriers, it represents a highly advanced, integrated system that has been rigorously tested and refined. China to its credit, is rapidly building a similar architecture, which they call composite information dominance. We've seen the first sea trials of some of its components as recently as last spring aboard the formidable Type 055 cruiser Lhasa. The Type 004 itself will carry advanced Type 346B radar panels, likely featuring gallium nitride modules, which are excellent for range and resolution. But here's the rub. The software stack that turns those raw radar dots into weapon quality tracks, processes threats, and orchestrates responses is still maturing. Until those complex algorithms face contested electromagnetic environments in a truly integrated, real-world scenario, the US still owns the faster OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, a critical advantage in high-intensity combat. If this kind of geeky numbers duel and strategic breakdown is your speed, then do yourself a favor. Whack that subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss our next face off. We're diving into hypersonic ship killers versus the Aegis Block 3 radar. And while you're at it, drop a comment below. What do you think China needs most right now? Better pilots, more advanced logistics, or something else entirely? Let's be clear. The Type 004 is a monumental step for China. Nuclear power, a bigger deck, EMALS, a stealth air wing, check, 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 and check. It's a powerful statement of intent and a truly impressive piece of naval engineering. But naval dominance, true dominance, is a three-legged stool, platform, people, and process. Beijing has just absolutely nailed the first leg, the platform. They've built a supercarrier that, in terms of raw specifications, stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best in the world. The second leg, however, is people. That will take another decade, maybe even two, of countless deck landings, grueling maintenance nights, and demanding Westpac deployments to build the deep institutional knowledge and ingrained operational expertise that the US Navy possesses. It's about creating generations of carrier aviators, LSOs, maintainers, and commanders who can operate these complex machines instinctively under pressure. And then there's the third leg, global logistics and alliances. This leg, for China, is still stubbornly stub length. Their nascent global support network, while growing, can't yet match the sheer scale and reach of the US Navy's global footprint, its vast network of supply ships, and its crucial web of treaty allies who offer bases and logistical hubs worldwide. So, does this mean the end of US naval dominance? Not yet, not by a long shot. The United States still retains a significant, though undeniably thinner, advantage. But make no mistake, 
the launch of the Type 004 signals the start of a genuine, two-carrier superpower race. And, my friends, 2025 is lap 1. This competition will define naval power for decades to come.